Good morning, my dearly beloved brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yesterday we spoke on the chief musician, and I was reminded by a few brethren and sisters um, about the work of James Thurtle, uh, who wrote a booklet, uh, the titles of the Psalms, and he advocated to splitting up some of the titles and putting them at the end of the previous psalm. He reasoned that uh, he reasoned from Habakkuk chapter three, which you'll have a look at in a minute. But the Hebrew Bible was not written as one long string of letters, which we can cut whatever we think. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown without any doubt that there was a line break in between the Psalms. And for example, here you see uh, a copy of Psalm 143, which I showed yesterday as well. And here, for example, we see the end of Psalm 142 and the beginning of Psalm 143 at a new line. And this says, Mismor le David, Yahweh Shema Tfilati, and so on. It's a psalm of David, Yahweh, hear my voice. So there's a very clear indication that the psalms, including the first verse, including that is the title, is part of the psalm. And there's no justification to take, for example, the phrase the chief musician and put it at the end of the previous psalm, as advocated by James Thurtle. The Dead Sea Scrolls put that to a complete halt. You cannot do it. It is not justified. If you talk to any Jewish Hebrew scholar, he will put you to shame if you would uh, say that. Nevertheless, it is important to look at Habakkuk chapter 3, which I had intended to do yesterday, but I ran out of time. Let us go to Habakkuk chapter 3, because that was used by James Thurtle to say that part of the psalm title belongs to the previous psalm. It's a wonderful chapter, chapter 3, because it's a prayer. It's a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shigionot. And there's one of the titles in the, used in the Psalms as well. But we need to go to that last verse, verse 19. And there it says, Yahweh Elohim is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds, and he will make me to walk upon my high places, full stop. There is no full stop in the Hebrew. Then it says, to the chief singer, same word as to the chief musician, on my stringed instruments. And that's the way it has been translated. And that's where Thurtle got the idea from, that you know, to the chief musician actually belongs to the previous, at the end of the previous psalm. But just like all the titles of the psalm, this verse should have been translated properly, like we try to translate all the psalms. And you can see on the overhead, to the chief singer on stringed instrument, in Hebrew is le manatseach, you mean, that's the phrase for the chief musician, be nigonotai. And it should have been translated, Yahweh, my Adon, is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to victory upon my stringed instruments. And that phrase, of course, he makes my feet like hinds' feet and sets people in my high places, is used in Psalm 18, which we looked at yesterday. But we should pay attention to what is actually said at the very end of this verse. It says... He will make me to walk upon my high places to victory on my stringed instruments. It indicates that Habakkuk made the Psalms his own instruments for prayer and worship. And he tells us further that if he can only walk 
to victory through our high places when we use the stringed instruments, namely the inspired words that David composed on the harp. King Hezekiah used a very similar expression. If you go to Isaiah chapter 38, when he was in great difficulties with the siege of the Assyrian around uh, Jerusalem, and in verse 1 it says, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus says Yahweh, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And he praised to God, and God gave him another 15 years. And what is his expression after he got this wonderful message from the prophet Isaiah in verse 15? What shall I say? He has both spoken unto me, and himself has done it, I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. Lord, by these things men live, and all, in all these things is the life of my spirit. So thou wilt recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. Thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. And then he says, Yahweh was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of Yahweh. He will sing his songs, my songs, like Habakkuk said, they are my uh, praises, on the stringed instruments, that is the neginoth. The neginoth are the psalms, as we saw yesterday. So the sickness of Hezekiah, after an astonishing escape from the Assyrians, was a humbling experience for Hezekiah. And being healed by God made him go softly, and humbly all the remaining years of his life. And what he said shows that he made the Psalms the focus of his worship. And sometimes, like Hezekiah, we also need to experience extreme distress before we turn to the stringed instruments and make the Psalms our song and our prayer all the days of our life. But now let us start at our session for today. And I'd like to start by looking at the word psalm. There are many psalms called a psalm of David. What does the word psalm actually mean? It's a Greek word. Remember we looked at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 where the apostle said, be not filled with wine, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That word making melody is psalo in the Greek. And to me it is quite unreasonable and not intelligent to use a Greek word, making melody, to translate the word psalm, mismor, which is the word in Hebrew. The word for psalm in Hebrew is mismor. It is not just a melody, a song, as the Greek indicates. Why would you take a Greek word to translate a Hebrew word? But what does the word mismor actually mean? Well, yesterday we saw with Le Menat Seach that, that most words, either verbs or nouns, are derived from three letter. We call that the three letter root. And this one is Zamar, which basically means to prune. And later it's also used to sing. In Leviticus 25, you don't have to look it up, it says, When thou shalt prune thy vineyard, that's the word for Sam. 
Well, why would you use the word for prune as the basis for the word for a psalm? I'd like you to go to Genesis 43. Because that's the first time when that word is used. And when you try and study the Bible using Hebrew words, it's always good to go back to the first time that word is used. Joseph was in Egypt. His brethren have been there. Simeon had been taken captive. And Joseph told them not to come back unless they bring Benjamin with them. Naturally, Jacob resisted for a long time. He had lost Joseph and he was not prepared to lose Benjamin as well. But he didn't know it was all in the plan of God. And he tried to appease that ruler in Egypt, which he didn't yet know was his own son, Joseph. And then in verse 11, it says, And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take off the best fruits in the land in your vessels, and carry down the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. Why did he want to send the best fruits to that ruler in Egypt, well, it says so in verse 14. And El Shaddai, God Almighty, give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. And if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. The word best fruit is Zimra. That's the word for a psalm. And of course, you do get the best fruits if you prune a tree, especially true of vines. They get those long runners, take up all the nourishment that don't bear any fruit, cut them off, because then the nourishment will go to the grapes. And that is what the Psalms are all about. It's not just a long narrative. There are short sentences that express the faith of the psalmist who, of course, didn't speak his own words. They were the words of the Holy Spirit. David said, the spirit of Yahweh spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. So they are the best fruits. In a similar uh, language, it says in Psalm 12, the words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And therefore, the word mismor means the pruned best fruit. But why ever would you call these psalms best fruits? And to understand that, we need to go to Hebrews chapter 13. It's a wonderful chapter, but we just concentrate on, on one verse. Uh, in verse 14, it says, of course, we have here no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of lips, giving thanks to his name. The word our lips, our, is in italics. And whenever possible, you should get rid of those words in italics. It's not the fruit of our lips. It's the fruit of lips. And if our prayers are the fruit of our lips, they are also a sacrifice of praise. See, what we offer to God whether we sing hymns or we say in prayer, should be a sacrifice. 
where does the fruit of lips come from which is acceptable to present to God so that we may find mercy with God as Jacob tried to find mercy with that ruler in Egypt when he gave him the best fruits. Well, the phrase, the fruit of lips, is referred to in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 57. It speaks about the waywardness of the Jewish people. But God in his mercy will heal Israel in verse 18. He says, I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comfort to him and to his mourners. How should we respond to that? Then God says, I create the fruit of lips. Peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near, says Yahweh, and I will heal him. God creates the fruit of lips. It's not a fruit, it's not our fruit which we should offer to God. God has prepared the praise which we should sacrifice, offer up to himself. And if we do that, then we get peace. Not just peace, double peace. Peace, peace, whether we are far off or near. And once we realize that prayers and praises are sacrifices, then we become more careful what we offer to God. It's not that I doubt the sincerity of any brother or sister that offers a prayer, not at all. It's not that I want to criticize our hymn book. It's just a principle of what we offer to God should be a sacrifice. Under the law, sacrifices were strictly prescribed. If you brought strange incense, as Nadab and Abihu did, for example, they were struck dead. If God says you've got to bring a lamb, you can't bring a cat. It's as simple as that. See, it says in Exodus chapter 13, it's talking about the altar of incense in verse 9. You shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you put drink offering thereon. You cannot offer strange incense, incense that has not been prescribed by God. And in the same chapter at the end, in verse 34, we get a prescription of the incense, how it should be made. Look at verse 34. Yahweh sent to Moses, take unto these sweet spices, stacta and onica and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each it shall be a like weight. Thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. Thou shalt beat some of it very small and put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with you. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, you shall not make to yourself according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for Yahweh, whosoever shall make like Unto that, to smell that too, shall be cut off from his people. Now, we don't offer incense, as they do in some churches, but the principle that you can't offer what you want still applies to us today. See, John Thomas, in Alpha's Israel, right in the beginning, in page 7, he says, It is true that no man has a right to worship God as he pleases. This is a Protestant fallacy. Man has a right to worship God only in the way God has himself appointed. 
And these are powerful words by our brother John Thomas. And he is dead on right. See, if you go to Psalm 141... That psalm teaches us that prayers are incense. It says in verse 2, My prayer shall be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. See, incense was always offered in the tabernacle and in the temple in the afternoon between our two and three o'clock in the afternoon. There was a morning sacrifice between six and seven and an evening sacrifice between two and three. And God often uses that time to answer prayers. If you go to 1 Kings, just a few examples. 1 Kings 18. I'm not suggesting that God doesn't answer at any other time, but there are special times when God answers prayer. In, we get a big sacrifice of Elijah on Mount Carmel. He mocked the priest of Baal. And in verse 29 it says, It came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. It was now two o'clock in the afternoon. There was neither force, nor any answer, nor any that regard us. And then Elias says to the people, Come near to me, and they repair the altar of Yahweh that was broken down. And then God answered him by fire. During the time of the evening sacrifice, when incense was offered in the tabernacle. We looked earlier at Zacharias. In Luke 1, we, we looked at this before, that it was uh, John's lot to burn incense in the temple of the Lord. And the whole people of the multitude ought to be outside praying, outside at the time of incense. And the angel appeared at the side of the altar of incense. And then he says, thy prayer is heard. Jesus died at the ninth hour of the day. It says in Mark 15, when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And God heard him, and he saved him from death, because he prayed at the hour of incense. The words he said were Psalm 22. The high priest on the day of atonement went with incense into the most holy He couldn't go without incense. And Jesus also, with the incense of Psalm 22 on his lips, entered into the most holy. And that was still in use in the Acts of the Apostle. Look at Acts chapter 3, for example. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth. There was a time of the evening sacrifice when they offered incense. So incense and prayer are linked together. And there was a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And then... Peter said, Silver and gold have I none in verse 6, but such as I give thee in the name of Jesus of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The prayer was answered because it was the hour of prayer, the hour of incense. And again, Peter had a vision in Acts chapter 10 of that sheet coming down at the ninth hour of the day. And the angel came to him. Cornelius was praying at the ninth hour of the day. And he received an answer. These men knew the principle of incense and of prayer. And they received an answer to their prayer of faith. And we can be sure that when we use the fruit of lips, created by God's Holy Spirit that was on David, that our words will be acceptable. 
and that we will have peace with God and that he will heal us as he promised if we do this acceptably and we really mean the words which we say with all our hearts. See, we read in Romans chapter 8, The difficult verse, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us our infirmities. What is our infirmity? We don't know what we should pray for as we must, it says actually in the Greek. And we can all identify with that. It's difficult to pray especially in public, and if you listen to the prayers, sincere prayers, we often fall into the same phraseology. It's difficult to pray and to know that God, will you hear your prayer? Are we using the right words? And therefore it says, the Spirit itself makes us intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We cannot improve on the words of the Psalms in our prayer. The spirit words which David composed on the Psalms, those spirit words, if he used them, they make intercession for us because they are God's words. They are God's fruit of lips which he has prepared. David said in Psalm 51, Open down my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. God has prepared the praise which we should use to offer up to him. And that is acceptable to God. But, like all prayers, we need to mean what we say. He that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because it makes us intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There's no point saying things and you don't mean them. And then, of course, we belong to that spiritual priesthood, as Peter says, ye are living stones, build up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Because it's only through Jesus Christ that we can approach the Father. And David was not the first one to use Psalms. You know very well that Psalm 90 is a psalm of Moses. The principle of using the best fruits to offer to God was already established then. If you go to Exodus chapter 15, because there's victory song after the Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea. Exodus 15, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto Yahweh and spake, saying, I will sing unto Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider as he is thrown into the sea. And then he says, Yah is my strength and psalm. It's the word zimra, it's the word for psalm. And he will become my salvation. He is my ale, and I will prepare a habitation, my father's Elohim, and I will exalt him. And that verse is used in Isaiah chapter 12 also. Yahweh is my strength and psalm. In Judges, we have the song of Deborah and Barak, and that falls in the same category. In Judges chapter 5, we have the song of Deborah, and it says in verse 3, Hear ye, O ye kings, give ear, ye princes. I, I will sing unto Yahweh, I will psalm to Yahweh, Elohim of Israel. It's the word zimra. It's the best fruits that have been pruned down, so only the pure words are left. So the Israelites were therefore used to the concept of psalming, using the best fruit, which had been induced by the Holy Spirit itself, from early on in their history. And you wonder why the dispensation of Israel came to an end. 
why did God destroy that nation and the first temple by the Babylonians? It is because they refused to use the Psalms. And that's what it says in Ezekiel chapter 8. In Ezekiel 8, verse 17, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is the light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Have you ever put a branch to your nose? It's rather strange, isn't it? They put a branch to your nose, well, it's meaningless. The translators did not know how to translate this. The word nose, af, is also the word for anger. Now, when you're angry, your nostrils flare up, don't you? So, nose and anger, the anger shows in your nose. But the word branch is the word for psalm. They send away the psalms in their anger. We don't want to use the best fruits anymore. So God didn't listen to them anymore, and the nation was destroyed. It's only through the mercy of God that a remnant of Israel shall be saved. And that's what happened in Jeremiah chapter 33. In Jeremiah 33, he says in verse 8, After, in verse 7, he will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. He will build them as at the first. And then he says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And then it says, I'm sorry, I've lost this now. At the same time, it says, I've also, in verse 8, I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. I don't have the right reference. It's in this chapter. Yeah, verse 6. Thank you very much, Brother David. And I will bring it to health and cure. I will cure them and reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. It's not the word for abundance. It is the word for entreat. God is going to show them, to reveal unto them how to entreat, how to pray in peace and of truth. It's the same word that was used by Isaac when he entreated Yahweh for his wife because she was barren. And only when Israel will use the best fruits which God has prepared, then they will be allowed to return to the land. Look what it says in Hosea chapter 14. God wants Israel to come back to him and to pray to him. Israel, return unto Yahweh thy Elohim, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to Yahweh and say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So shall we render the calves of our lips. I'm glad I don't have calves walking on my ribs on my lips. Is the word parim. It's the word for fruits. Pari is fruit in Hebrew. So will we render the fruit of lips. Those are the best fruits which God has prepared Himself. Israel will realize that they've neglected the praise of Israel. In verse 8, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I've heard him and observed him. I'm like a green fir tree, 
from me is thy fruit found. So, brothers and sisters, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes us intercession for us, which words which can be uttered. We cannot improve on the words of the Psalms in our prayers. And I recommend to you to study the Psalms and to start using them in your prayers. You know yourself that when you hear a brother praying, the more scripture he uses in his prayer, the more powerful it is. But if you use the best fruits which God has created, then we can be sure that God will hear us because the spirit words make us intercession for us. So we've learned that those first verses of the Psalms contain a spiritual meaning that relates to the contents of the Psalms. We've learned that the word psalm means best fruits. The chief musician means to him that overcomes. The psalms were written to help David, but primarily Jesus, to overcome the world in themselves. And they use them for their prayers. And we too can be helped to overcome when we use these words in our prayers. See, the word groanings in Romans, which groanings which cannot be uttered, is a bit of a difficult word. But in Mark chapter 7, they brought a man to Jesus who was deaf and dumb. And he took him aside in verse 33 of Mark 7. Put his fingers in his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. I said to him, Yifatach, that is, be opened. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, It says, we know not, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building with, of God, and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desire to be closed upon with a house which is in, from heaven. If so be that being closed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but closed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. This word groan, stinazo in the Greek, it's the same as the groanings of Romans chapter 8 and 26, doesn't mean to complain because you're fed up. It expresses a longing for our sufferings to be over. If we don't suffer, we don't long to be saved. And if you use the words of the Psalms, which are the spirit words of Christ, then those spirit words make intercession for us. Because we cannot utter those deep groanings which we read of in the Psalms when David was persecuted, when Jesus was persecuted, when he healed that deaf and dumb man, he groaned in himself because he saw in that man the result of sin. We were all born blind. We are not born with the knowledge of God. And Jesus must have groaned to God with those groanings which cannot be uttered using the words of Psalm, of the Psalms. Yahweh, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, Yahweh, how long? Psalm number six. That's what Jesus would have done. Not for oh, not a deaf man to heal. No, he felt the result of sin in himself, as it were, when that man stood in front of him. There are, of course, many words in the Psalms which have never been translated. And that's a great pity. And this study is far too short to go into all of them. We see words like sila. Soon I'll be talking about the word sila. It doesn't mean to pause or anything or go into the next section of the psalm. 
It's got something to do with value. Nechilot. And you have all these words on that handout which you should have. Yes? Nechilot means inheritance. Shigan, shigayon, the word used by Habakkuk, means wanderings. Higayon means meditation. Shemanit means anointing. Miktam means marked, and so on. All these words should have been translated in the Psalms. Alamot means over death. Go to Psalm 9, for example, where it is used. And they have all sorts of stories about a champion and things like that. But it doesn't mean that at all. Psalm 9, the first verse or the title says, To the chief musician upon Mutlaben, the Psalm of David. And they refer that to Goliath, of course, a man of sons, is a champion. It doesn't mean that. It says, to the chief musician, to him that overcomes, upon Mut, upon Mavet. Mavet is the word for death. Le Ben means for the son. The psalm, best fruit for David, which means the beloved. Are you right, Sister Beulah? <laughs> so this psalm, which continues in Psalm 10, is written to him that overcomes over death. It's for the son, the best fruits for the beloved. Because names also have a meaning. David is, of course, David, the son of Jesse, but his name means the beloved. Who is the great beloved of God? Is it not the Lord Jesus Christ? We saw yesterday in the title of Psalm 18, Saul was certainly a person that lived at the time of David, but his name means the grave. There are psalms for the sons of Korah. Korah means being bold, kareach. Like what the young man said to Elijah the prophet, you bold and you koreach, you koreach. But when you're in mourning, the men used to shave off their head. So when you see a man that is shaved, he's in mourning. And though we do mourn if we suffer for Christ. And those psalms are used in the time of mourning. The psalms for Asa, but Asaf means a gathering, a meeting, an ecclesia. We are an Asifa at the moment. So we can use certain psalms by the whole ecclesia. And Yeduthon means confession. But I'd like to pay some attention to the word Sila. It occurs 71 times in the book of the Psalms and three times in the prayer of Habakkuk. But often we don't read it, do we? If you have a brother called up to read a psalm, more often than not, he doesn't read the title, doesn't say Sila, doesn't say the word Higayon, because we don't understand them. And yet they're part of the Holy Spirit word of God. So therefore they must have a meaning. If you go to Psalm 3, three times in this psalm, the word sila is used. Yeah, well, how are, it's a psalm of David, the best fruit for the beloved, when he fled from Absalom, his son. Yeah, well, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many that say of my soul, there is no salvation, what help is salvation for him in Elohim, Selah. But thou, Yahweh, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto Yahweh as my voice, and he I says, I will cry unto Yahweh as my voice, and he will hear me out of his holy hill, Sila. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for Yahweh sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousand of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, Yahweh, save me, my Elohim, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation which was denied to him in verse 2. They said, no salvation for him in Elohim. Salvation belongs unto Yahweh. Thy blessing upon thy people, Selah. 
But if you read in the commentaries, people don't know what to do with this word. Some people say it means lifting up the voice in song to make a pause or um, to proceed to the next section of the psalm. There's no conclusive evidence in all the writings about this word, sila. And you read often statements like this, we are left in the domain of surmise regarding the meaning of the term sila. You frequently encounter that. So how do you deal with difficult words? Words that are left untranslated in the Bible. As I said before, we need to go to the first time that word is used. And in this case, we need to go to the book of Job in chapter 28. Where that word, the same word, sila, is used, but now it has been translated. The chapter starts by seeing how men dig down deep in the earth and they bring all sorts of wonderful things out of their minds and it speaks about paths which we don't know about it. And when he looked at the endeavors of men to find things, he asked the right question. Job says, where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knows not the price thereof. Now is it found in the land of the living? The depth says not, it's not, the depth says not in me. The sea says not with me. It cannot be gotten for the gold. Now it shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be silat, that's the word sila, valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. Again in verse 19, the topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it. Now shall it be silat, with pure gold. It's something of great value, something of great price. And when it is stuck at the end of a verse, we should uh, pay special attention to the value of what is written in that particular sentence. It's also used in Habakkuk chapter 3. Actually, it is used three times in this prayer of Habakkuk. You have it in verse 3. Elohim shall come from Timan, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Sila. Verse 9. Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oath of the tribes, even thy word, Sila. And in verse 13, thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even the salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. Why three times this word Selah? Well, verse 3 is not difficult to understand. Because Elohim shall come from Timan and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Well, Moses spoke about it in Deuteronomy. And so does Jude, quoting Enoch. Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand of saints. From his right hand went the fiery law uh, for them. That is Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2. And these words we should know almost by heart. There are many verses in the Bible that use, in the Psalms, that use that verse, uh, that verse, Sila. And in verse 13, it's the very same. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Sila. Think of Psalm 110. When Christ shall become king, he will destroy the head of over all those nations. But verse 9 is difficult to understand. It says, thy bow was made quite naked according to the oath of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Now, cut out the italics, first of all. And it actually means, thy bow 
not shall be made make it, shall be filled with the tribes saying the word Sila. It's those people that know how to use the word Sila, or rather the verses which have that Sila, those sentences of great value. It says in Psalm 3, for example, there are many that say, my soul, there's no salvation for him in Elohim. We looked at that Psalm. It says in Psalm 20, remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice, Sila. Psalm 32, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about as songs of deliverance, Sila. Psalm 73, I remembered Elohim and I was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed, Sila. They're like short prayers. It reminds us of Nehemiah, that said a very short prayer at the moment. And if he would learn those Sila verses, then we may be used by the Lord Jesus Christ, like arrows in his bows when he comes back to set up his kingdom and destroy his enemies. So these things are wonderful. We should learn them by heart. We should use them in our prayers. And if you had a difficult day, as we all have, what better day to end with Psalm 4? Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Sila. So, brothers and sisters, I hope that this may have helped you a bit in seeing how important it is to use the Psalms in our prayers and in our worship to God. They should be the fruit of our of lips, which should come of our lips. Open thou my lips, says David and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. There's one last verse I'd like to quote is of Psalm 65. Yeah. To the chief musician, to him that overcometh, the best fruits, the song of David, Praise waiteth for thee, Elohim, in Zion. But look in the margin. It says, Praise is silent to thee, O God, in Zion. How can we praise God and be silent? It says in Ecclesiastes, God is in heaven and you are upon the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And if we use God's words, then we are silent. Because they're not our words, they're God's words. Those are the best fruits. That should be the fruit of our lips when we pray to our Heavenly Father. And then we can be sure that He will hear our prayers.